about we stand together and just open our hearts up to hear God's Word. Sometimes we can come to God's Word and be really familiar, but I just think it's awesome to be able to just say, God, here we are, speak to us. Hey, you might want to stretch out your hand or close your eyes. Father God, I thank you for your presence here this morning by the power of your Spirit. I thank you that you love each person in this room. You love everyone that you created. And I pray right now that you would take your word and apply it to every heart. And so, Lord, we do say, speak, Lord, we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you take your seats? <clears throat> well, when my boys were really little, if you've got nieces or nephews or um, you've served in kids' ministry or you've got grandkids, um, you've been around little children, you would have probably seen this phenomena. Um, they loved to get dressed up in superhero costumes, like, I mean, obsessed. <laughs> and so we had uh, the full-blown Ninja Turtles suit. We had, you know, the Captain America with the shield and they'd be out in the backyard, um, you know, fighting the bad guys, fighting the imaginary bad guys and, and uh, waging war <laughs> on, uh, on the evil uh, people who were trying to undermine the superheroes. And it was just such a delight to watch kids engaging in that sort of make-believe play. But you know, the battle that we're in is not make-believe. It's not make-believe. The spiritual warfare that we're engaged in as followers of Jesus and adopted sons and daughters of God, it's actually very real. And it's relentless. Just like in physical warfare in an army facing you know, an opposing side, there are lulls there's these temporary intervals of lack of activity. <laughs> uh, there's times of persistent fire. And then there's also times of intense, full-blown spiritual attacks by our enemy. And so the Bible makes it clear what we're up against. It doesn't sh uh, shy away from telling us about this reality. But it also wonderfully reminds us of what our conquering King Jesus has won for us pretty awesome. And so God wants us to know how to apply the victory that Jesus won for us, not just to know it in our heads, but to actually know what does it mean for our lives? How do we walk our everyday lives in dependence on the Holy Spirit and in, in reliance on the victory that Jesus won for us? So we've been doing <laughs> this Standing Strong series as Pastor Sam shared. And we have been looking at Ephesians 10 to 19 and I wanna read it today in uh, the message paraphrase. Let's read it together. God is strong and He wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his demonic angels. <laughs> Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon that God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll be still on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's Word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Isn't that a refreshing way of, of hearing and, and, and unpacking that amazing passage that Paul talks about? Do you know, we're meant to take everything that Jesus has won for us all the help He's provided for us, every weapon that God has issued. Why? Because He wants us standing strong and steadfast, immovable, unshakable in our faith. And we all have wobbly times. <laughs> 
But that's why we need each other as well because sometimes someone else coming alongside you and saying, do you know what? God is for you. You might not feel Him right now, but He's not gone missing. He hasn't gone AWOL. He loves you. In fact, He loves you so much, He laid down His life for you. You can rest and stake your life upon that and to have people around us in the family of God who will speak that over us, who will pray for us, who will encourage us is so important. So maybe this series has awoken you for the first time or reminded you that we are in a battle, that there's more to this life than just the physical day-to-day activities and appointments and events and housekeeping and gardening and school drop-off and looking after kids or grandkids and study and work and volunteering and relating with your family and friends. We live in that, but there's a backdrop to that a spiritual reality that's happening all around us that we're not meant to ignore. The battle for people's hearts and minds is raging across this earth and we have a very real enemy who hates God and hates human beings made in God's image. And he wants to take as many people with him to hell forever. So from now until Jesus comes back, there's no neutral ground. There's no neutral ground I believe Jesus wants us to really understand that this morning. There's no neutral ground. We can't ignore this battle or wish it away. It's part of the normal Christian life for anyone who chooses to follow Jesus and live for him. But the good news is that we don't have to try and ignore it. (laughs) We don't have to be daunted or intimidated by it. And we definitely don't need to run away. We can stand firm and resist any attack that comes our way in Jesus' name. And so Jesus, when He walked this earth, when you read in the Gospels, He lived with this constant awareness of this battle. And so whenever you see Him moving about in people's lives, there's this constant clash of kingdoms that took place. And Jesus He just waded right into it because he knew his authority. He knew who he was. He knew why he'd come. He was able to just say, no, I resist that. Get away. (laughs) He depended on God and his unchanging word. The Apostle Paul also lived with this constant awareness of spiritual opposition and attack. He didn't obsess about it. He didn't go looking for it. He wasn't swayed by it. He continued to preach the gospel and plant churches and and, uh, reach people with the love of Jesus He continued to raise up new disciples. He wasn't swayed from the mission Jesus had given him despite massive suffering and personal cost, but he wasn't denying the reality that there was a constant backdrop in his ministry and obedience to Jesus that he needed to be aware of. And so the scripture talks about we are not unaware. And I really felt that through this message, God wants to remind us today to encourage us, not, we're not unaware. We're not meant to just go through life with the blinkers on and ignore this stuff. And in the context of Paul writing uh, this scripture, he's talking about forgiveness in the life of the church and how the, the Corinthian church had originally said to a man who was engaging in some pretty destructive behaviour and wasn't listening, you know, you need to go and t- we release you to do what you need to do. <laughs> and... Uh, And then he repented, he had a change of heart and he asked for forgiveness and asked to come back. And so Paul's talking about this forgiveness. Don't hold out on forgiveness, but welcome him back because he is genuinely repentant. And he says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. We're not unaware of his schemes. Are you aware of the schemes of the enemy and his tactics to distract to discourage, to bring disunity and ultimately to destroy your life. The Apostle Peter was very aware of it. In 1 Peter, he wrote to persecuted churches and let's read this together. He wrote, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles, exiles, foreigners, people who are not citizens of this earth, scattered throughout the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He wrote to these churches who are being persecuted, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit 
to be obedient to Jesus Christ. They're in persecution and he's writing to them to say, God has chosen you. He has not overlooked you. He's not forgotten you, but he's called you by the power of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus and to be sprinkled with his blood. And then he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. And we read that grace and peace be yours in lots of the openings of Paul's writings. But Peter says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. You guys are going to need it. (laughs) You're going to need to draw from the grace of Jesus and you're going to need to live in the awareness of His peace because you're under persecution right now. And he goes on to write to them about where they can rest their hope. What is unshakable and certain in the middle of hardship and suffering? And so we read in verses six to seven, he says, in all this, the fact that you have a a living hope in Jesus and this new inheritance that He's won for you that can never perish, spoil or fade, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, to our heavenly Father, our faith is more precious than gold. It's more precious and more valuable than a rare and costly gem. It's more precious and valuable than all the riches in this world. Why? Because it's only by faith that you receive everything Jesus has won for you. So the enemy, he wants to kill and destroy and steal your faith. That's one of his great missions. He wants to block people from coming into the kingdom of God. And when they're in the kingdom of God, he wants to snatch and steal and discourage and squash faith. Why? Because faith is how you lay hold of and say, everything that Jesus did for me, everything that He won for me on the cross, I take that and that is for me. That is personally what He did for me. Without faith, you cannot receive His extravagant mercy, His forgiveness, His provision and His ongoing leadership of your life. You cannot receive it. In Hebrews 11.1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We cannot see Jesus physically. We cannot see some of the things that He's won for us, but we put our trust in it because we listen to His Word and faith starts to rise in our heart and we know that it's true, the assurance and conviction of the Spirit says, this is true. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So some of you, the enemy has been trying to kill and steal and destroy and attack your faith. And this is a message for you. This is God's encouragement to you. So keep listening. (laughs) Writing to the persecuted churches who are being targeted by the enemy's schemes, Peter encourages them. He says, though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result or the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The enemy doesn't want people to hold on to the things Jesus has won for us and to recognise and realise that we have eternal salvation, that nothing can snatch us out of His hand, Jesus says, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, that He will carry and faithfully lead us from this earth into His presence, that we stand before Him holy and without fault. And so not only are we not unaware, but we're not surprised We're not surprised. And sometimes the lie can be, well, no one else is going through this, so you must be a really bad Christian. 
Who do you think you are? Because no one else, look at everyone else around you. They're like soldiering on with the Lord. They're like super Christians. They're amazing. And you're the only one who struggles with this. And that lie can come and it can undermine our faith to think that, well, maybe I'm, and then accusation and condemnation just gets dumped on us. In 1 Peter 4.12, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you or to test your faith as though something strange were happening to you. (laughs) When you face a spiritual attack, don't be surprised. Every Christ follower around the world faces spiritual opposition. And so that lie that you're the only one is a lie. It's meant to isolate you and getting you focused on all the things that you can't do or all the things that you can't make happen instead of lifting up your eyes to the one who can do it through his power. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our fight is not against human beings, but against the rulers, the authorities and the powers of this dark world. It is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly world. And so he goes on, Peter goes on to write to these persecuted churches In chapter five, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. The temptations, the fiery darts, the lies, this is not unique to you. Do you know what an encouragement that would have been to them? Not only does God see and know, but He doesn't leave us alone. We are not unaware and we're not surprised and we are definitely not defenceless. <laughs> in Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Goes on to say, therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand or you can stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, 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 stand. Four times in that uh, passage is the word stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in the... um, New American Standard Bible, it says with in the NIV, but in the, some other translations it says having, having, having. And a soldier, a Roman soldier had to have the belt of truth buckled around his waist so that his armour wouldn't fall down, he wouldn't trip over himself. He had to have the breastplate of righteousness on him so that that would hold everything in place. He had to have the sandals of the gospel of, well, sandals, we know what Paul's illustration is, on his feet so that he was ready and prepared for battle. And so he had having these things on him all the time, even when he went to get a cup of tea, if they had tea in those days, I don't know. But he would have this armour on him, right? But then Paul decisively makes a shift in this passage from having to take up. And so he talks about the fact that the shield and the sword and the helmet of salvation are things that would be with the soldier ready at any time. So when there was an attack or when there was a call to come and fight, he would take up the sword of the Spirit. He would take up the shield of faith. He would take up the helmet of salvation and put those things on. There was this intentional and not passive taking up. And so we get in Ephesians 6.13, in addition to all this, The truth, righteousness, our right standing with Christ, the gospel of peace, our readiness to share the gospel with people. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can, you can, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows or the fiery darts of the evil one. And so this shield was not this small little round thing. It was like a, almost like a door. Let's look at some pictures it was big. <laughs> it was meant to be so that it protected, your, your whole body could crouch down and, and, and be protected behind it. It protected all the vital organs, absolutely, but they could link shields together and crouch in together so that those fiery darts that came could protect them. And this is amazing because 
they could just keep moving forward, shuffling forward with all their shields up. So if someone was injured or wounded or in the middle, they just keep putting the shields up and off they go. Isn't that like the body of Christ? Isn't that like the church? That sometimes when we don't have the faith, we've got people around us saying, do you know what? You can do this. I've got you. I'm praying for you. I'm with you. And we can keep moving forward together as the army of God. Isn't that amazing? The shield was constructed so that it would extinguish the dangerous missiles then in use. These arrows dipped in pitch that were um, set alight and fired. And without the shield of faith up, they would land in the opposing side's camp and disperse and there'd be little spot fires and panic that would happen. But as they lifted up the shield of faith, they could stop those fiery darts and render them ineffective. The shield was dipped in water prior to battle was made of two layers of wood glued together, then covered with linen and then with a tough animal hide. Finally, it was bound with iron above and below. Whereas the breastplate secured the vital organs with the shield, a soldier could turn it in every direction to protect himself. What are these fiery darts? (laughs) Doubt, unbelief, cynicism, that can rob you of your inheritance in Christ and potential in life. And so some of the great Christian writers, people of faith throughout history have had these fiery darts of doubt come their way. They've just all of a sudden gone into a season where they've been plagued with a thought that's just come into their mind and they're like, why would I think that? (laughs) Why am I struggling with this? Discouragement is another one. Discouragement. You're the only one. You care for everyone else, but no one cares for you. You're all by yourself. You're working so hard and no one even notices. Discouragement. Mischievous accusations that can inflame our conscience with false guilt because guilt can cripple us internally. So these, these things that can come and just accuse us and just accuse, I might even come in the, the first person of your thoughts to say, who do you think you are? If people knew what you did this week, how can you stand and speak to children about the love of God? Romans 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it can be unsought of thoughts or pictures or imaginations or visions, just even horrible things that you think, why am I thinking this? Why am I thinking this blasphemous thought against God? Why am I thinking of this, you know, picture that to me and according to the Word of God is just so far away of His beautiful picture for sexual flourishing. Why am I thinking of this thought? And it can just flood people's minds. You know, I've had people before share with me that they go to worship God in a service and they're bombarded with um, really horrible sexual images, just bombarding them as they go to worship God. Guilt can cripple us internally, but that's where we need to lift up that shield of faith and say, Lord, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. I tell those thoughts to get lost in Jesus' Name. I am gonna worship the living God. I'm here, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm adopted. And I'm gonna lift up my voice because it's Jesus' blood that has rescued me, not my own effort. It might be thoughts of terrifying fear, terrifying fear of sickness, of rebellion, of lust, of malice. There's lots of things that can just bombard our thinking. What about the arrows or fiery darts of words that some people can speak, not even knowing that the enemy's anointing what they're saying to try and really penetrate our hearts. There can be cruel and negative and destructive words that are like fiery darts that come at you. The enemy will always try and sow mistrust and disunity and division. Cass didn't smile at me today. She mustn't like me very much. Do you know what I mean? Oh man, that what they were really meaning when they said this was this. Instead of going to that person and saying, hey, when you said this, (laughs) this is how I felt, can we just talk about it? 
sowing division, sowing disunity, sowing things that are going to separate and wedge relationship, holding on to offence. And then temptation. Sometimes it can be something that you have, by Jesus' strength and power, said no to. I'm I'm following Jesus. I'm not going to engage in that. (laughs) But that temptation can come back like a flood. And the lie can be, you know what? You're never going to get free of this. You're, you're always going to have to be bound by this. You're always going to have to be someone who is, is lacking and needing, you know, can't be used by God because you're struggling with this area of temptation in your life. When these fiery darts come, it is active and intentional reliance on God. Trusting that He will shield us by His power, according to His Word, that extinguishes and snuffs out and renders the enemy's attacks ineffective. And so in 1 Peter 1, he writes to those persecuted churches and he says, you know, praise God for the living hope and the inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. It is our dependence on God that protects us like a shield. A shield brought security to a soldier. It brings, so does faith. In Galatians 2.20, it says, Not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this life, I live in the body. I live by what? Faith in the Son of God, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. And that's a daily thing, a daily thing, a daily reliance. Imagine a soldier in the thick of a battle without a shield. (laughs) One day I remember coming forward for prayer for something and Pastor Bill Um, started to encourage me and he said, your shield's down. And I said, what? (laughs) He said, your shield's down. Come on, let's lift up your shield of faith. He recognises straight away that the enemy was just having a field day in discouragement and lies in my life and that I needed, you know, a brother in Christ, uh, someone who was my leader to encourage me to lift up that shield of faith. Lift up the shield of faith today (laughs) for others around you, for yourselves. Lift it up. And it's not faith in faith. It's not like mustering up this awesome faith that we have to whip it up. We have to be really loud and energetic. It's not talking about that. What it's talking about is faith in an object. When you sit on a chair, you don't think about, oh, how am I going in sitting on this chair? You have faith that the chair is gonna hold you up. Faith is faith in an object and faith, our faith is faith in a faithful Jesus. The early church in Acts, the first thing that they did when Peter got out of jail for Peter and John got out of jail for, for God using them to heal a crippled man from birth. The first thing they did, the ch- it says, when the, the church heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They lifted up that shield of faith. Oh, sovereign Lord, <laughs> now stretch out your hand. They started to just pray and lift up that shield of faith. Again, when Peter was in prison in Acts 12, And there was a miracle. God broke him out of prison. But it says this amazing verse in Acts 12, 5. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. There's some people across our church family who are facing sickness, who are facing discouraging situations, who are facing an onslaught from the enemy. And God's encouraging us today to be a people that stand in faith and pray earnestly and trust the Lord for His deliverance. We don't know or see the whole picture. We don't know why at times in the sovereignty of God, He allows James to be martyred and Peter to live. But we throw ourselves upon Him and His goodness. And through our faith, we lay hold of the powerful promises of God in times of trouble and discouragement. It is by faith that we lay hold of the 
promises of God in times of vicious, fiery temptations. Paul knew (laughs) that only faith's reliance on God could quench and deflect such awful weapons when they're held at a person. The only safeguard lies not in introspection, trying harder, but lifting up our eyes and looking to our God and proclaiming His character, proclaiming what He's done, resting in the finished work of Christ as we heard about today. So I want to finish by talking about Christ, our shield, because actually when Paul talks about a shield, it's actually Jesus. Jesus is your shield if you follow Christ and if you don't know Him today, you can put your trust in Him. Christ, our shield. In uh, Genesis, I'm gonna read, just read some scriptures over us to finish. In Genesis 15, God appears to Abraham and he says, do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. I am your shield. Isn't that awesome? Christ, our shield. Have a listen to this one. Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. We run to Him. He is our shield. Psalm 18.2, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn or the strength of my salvation, my stronghold. 2 Samuel 22, 36, you make your saving help my shield. Your help has made me great. Psalm 33, we wait in hope for the Lord for He is our help and shield. In Him our hearts rejoice for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in You. Psalm 3, 3, but You, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. That's a word for some of you this morning. He Himself is your shield around you. He is the one who's your reward when you're gonna face Him one day as you go to be before Him in heaven. Like Jesus, His whole life was actually about you and you got me through this and you protected me and you presenced me with your very presence as I went through this situation. You yourself are my shield. Psalm 25, 15 says, My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only He will release my feet from the snare. And Hebrews 4. In Hebrews 10, it talks about, first of all, a new and living way that Jesus Christ, by His body, has opened up for us. There's no barrier between us and God. There's nothing that can keep us when we followed, when we've received Christ's forgiveness and salvation, there's nothing that can keep us or separate us from running to our heavenly Father. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it. But in Hebrews four it says, "Therefore, since we have a great High Priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God." Not only did he ascend into heaven, but he died for every one of your sins. That's why there's no condemnation, because Jesus took the punishment in your place. Not only did he take your punishment, but he gives you God's A plus record, (laughs) or his A plus record. We have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess Christ, my shield. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses. There's this amazing um, verse in 2 Timothy 4.17 when Paul is talking about facing trial. And he said, everyone else deserted me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That's Jesus, your champion. Isn't that a beautiful, tender picture? The King of Kings who we're supposed to bow down before, comes and stands with us to strengthen us. And so I love that line from O Holy Night when it says, He knows our need. Our weakness is no stranger. Behold your King before Him lowly bend. And yet this King comes and stands alongside to strengthen. This King 
is not far and distant, he's close. We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence (laughs) so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can come before him, not on the basis of our effort, our performance, but just thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. You are my shield. I'm standing in who I am in you. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing on the fact that you'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm standing on the fact that I can resist the enemy and he will flee from me. I thank you, Lord, that uh, when I'm tempted that you will give me a way out. We're gonna pray. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for your word to us this morning. Christ, our shield, our very great reward. You do not leave us defenceless. (laughs) You don't leave us to fight the battles that come our way on our own. You yourself come and stand alongside us to strengthen us. You yourself are our shield. And we just thank you for that. Just start to thank him in your heart. Thank you.